speaker is John Smart, founder and president of the Acceleration Studies Foundation, a nonprofit community that seeks to help individuals better understand and manage continuous accelerating change. He is a future and systems theorist who studies science and technological culture with an emphasis on accelerating change, evolutionary development, computational autonomy, and a hypothesis known in futurist circles as the technological singularity. I'm assuming we'll hear more about that. Mr. Smart lives in Mountain View, California. He has a Bachelor of Science in Business from the Haas School at the University of California, Berkeley, and an MS in Future Studies from the University of Houston. He has done undergrad, post-baccalaureate, and graduate work in medical, biological, cognitive, computer, and physical sciences at UC San Diego, UCLA, and UC Berkeley. Mr. Smart also has one book, Planning a Life in Medicine, for pre-medical students, and is currently writing his second on the topic of accelerating change. The topic of his speech for today is Foresight Development in a World of Accelerating Change, Thoughts from an Evo Devo Futurist. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome John Smart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's an honor to be here. I have a beautiful campus. I was walking it last night. Um, a great phase of your lives. You just have so many options. Of course, those of us in the front row here, we have a little less options. We're a little older. But you guys, the sky is the limit for the typical student, modern 21st century world, right? So what are we here to do today? We're here to talk about foresight. <clears throat> it's also called future studies. Foresight's the term that's been uh, taking off the most around the world, however. And foresight is something very simple. It's basically a complement to hindsight and insight. Now, we all have hindsight. We take courses in history. We think about the past, how things work, systems work. Insight is when we're focusing on the now. We're here. We're oriented. We know where we are. And foresight is anticipation. What's going to come next? Right? The better we have, understand our, our hindsight and our insight, the better our foresight gets. <clears throat> okay, the course, uh, the, the talk we're going to do today, um, change the title just a little bit, uh, because the focus of this series is sustainability. And you're going to get two futurists in this series, myself and Edie Weiner at the end. Um, and what we can do is give you a big picture view of sustainability. And that's what I'm going to do today. The subtitle is A Framework for Thinking About the Universe, You, and Foresight in a World of Accelerating Technological Change. And that's the other theme we're going to talk about today, is big picture thinking about this world where technology goes faster and faster every year, doesn't it? Right? I mean, it's an obvious thing. Who's thinking about it? Various people. I'm going to give you an example of some of the thinking that's going on in this really interesting space. Now, these slides are available at our website, accelerating.org slash slides.html. I'm a believer in putting a lot of information on a slide and going pretty fast through it because you guys can pick your own fall line through that information. If you want to get the stuff that you missed, just download the slides later, right? So who are we? Well, we're a small nonprofit called ASF, and we... Uh, we were founded back in 03 because we noticed there was no other nonprofit that we were able to find that was thinking about accelerating change, specifically focusing on accelerating change, things that go faster every year and have for long periods of time. And there's only a small number of those things, right? Most things don't do that. They eventually saturate. They reach a maximum speed and they kind of level out. But there's certain things in our lives information technologies, computation technologies, sensing technologies, nanotechnologies, that as far back as we look have been going faster. Right? First humans picked up the first stone. 
Right? Homo habilis, four million years ago, throwing that stone at 90 miles an hour with his opposable thumb. You think, well, that's pretty cool. Now he doesn't need to be bigger, doesn't need to have thicker skin. Right? All that human needs to do is to have all of his buddies throw stones at 90 miles an hour whenever something comes close to them. <laughs> and from that point forward, we're sitting around the campfire, we're fracturing our stones, we're sticking them on sticks, we're synchronizing our squeaks. That's what we're doing, right? So that we can understand what this tool making is doing. And from that point forward, our technologies start accelerating. And so now we're in a world where you go to Best Buy, buy a computer, you go back two years later, you see a new computer, <laughs> you go, wait a minute, that thing's got twice the memory, twice the uh, CPU capacity, right? Maybe twice the bandwidth uh, for the same price. My computer's obsolete. Well, it's not obsolete, but <laughs> it's old news, right? And I'm here to tell you that that acceleration, the acceleration in computational capacity that has pretty much driven a lot of the wealth that we, we have right here, right, all around us, it doesn't look like that's going to slow down in our lifetimes. Okay? Because the basic physics of the universe seem to allow continued efficiencies in acceleration. Right? Material science and the research physicists that play around with these computing technologies at small scales discover amazing efficiencies over and over again. They're not creating those efficiencies. They're discovering them. They're actually built into the physics of the universe, as far as we can tell, right? This incredible computation-friendly universe that we're in. Right. So we study accelerating change, and we study it. We have to, have to use categories. We break it down into science, technology, business, and society. So you can see our bias right away. We say that to be a good futurist, half of your thinking should be about science and technology, right? Because if you don't understand where they're going, there's going to be a tidal wave that's going to come along, that's going to change the whole game. And that's the world we're in today. Okay. So we, we compress society into a, a quarter of the whole things we study, because society is very important, and society uses these tools, but the tools themselves are incredibly powerful and useful. And what I want to argue today is, I want you to think about science and technology like something that we're gardening. Think of technology like something organic, like a snail shell or a spider's web. And we are actually crafting it or gardening it. These plants, these technological organisms, well, not quite organisms, just put quotes around that, right? But these technological systems, we're gardening them. And we can bring good technologies out earlier than bad technologies and dirty technologies, technologies that have what the economists call serious negative externalities, right? And so those good technologies, because they came out earlier, can help us manage the downsides of other technologies. Right? We can also study change at at least uh, these five different levels of analysis. Personal, organizational, societal, global, and universal. That stuff I told you about the computing continuing to accelerate in our lifetime because it looks like it's built into the physics. Well, that would be a universal level of analysis, right? But... There's, all these levels are important, right? Now, we practice a kind of foresight that we call evolutionary developmental future studies. Okay? Now, this is a model of change that proposes that there's two fundamental types of change that we need to think about. Development and evolution. Okay? And they do very different things. Evolution, we can call the right hand of change, or left hand of change, right? Evolution is constantly branching out, trying new things. Evolution is creating variation. Okay? Development's doing something completely different. Development's taking all the chaos in the world, and it's organizing it so that all paths lead to Rome. So when you're developing as an organism from a, from a fertilized cell, you have all these molecules streaming in from the environment. And your developmental genetic toolkit uses all those chaotic molecules coming in and it converges them into a form. 
And if you have two genetically identical twins, they look roughly the same from across the room, don't they? But almost everything about them, when you look at them up close, is different. Because it's all molecular chaos that got organized into a convergent developmental form. We talk about our futures. I, I don't know what kind of business you guys are going to go into, what kind of careers you're going to have, what your worldviews are going to be. Those are all evolutionary choices you're making right now. But I know just about every single one of you is going to go through a developmental trajectory. We all know roughly when we're going to die. We know roughly what our capacities are at each stage of our lives. If we plan wisely for those things, then we have a retirement that we can look forward to. We can optimize each stage, or we can fight it and be ignorant of it. Right? That's another choice. So we have two fundamental ways we can look at our future. Evolutionary possibility, developmental forces. Okay? Some of the trends that I'm going to discuss today that seem to be intrinsic to the future of all complexity on Earth. This is my opinion. You bring in a futurist, you're going to get opinions, right? Hopefully you want as many different opinions as you can get because somewhere in that bell curve of opinions that you get in the cognitively diverse set is going to be the actual future. The future that I, story that I'm going to tell is that we're going to continue to see accelerating intelligence, interdependence, and immunity. That means resilience. That means system protection. Okay? from our global social technological system. Why? Because we have to. These technologies get more and more complex. If we don't start designing them more and more like biological systems, then all kinds of uh, failure states emerge. Okay? Unfortunately, we're well along into understanding how biology works and applying the lessons of biology to our technology. Let me give you some examples. Another developmental trend is that our technology is becoming increasingly autonomous. This technological singularity term you heard earlier, that's what that is. That's technologies that become more self-provisioning, self-repairing, self-directing, and they're able to do higher and higher cognitive functions. Was it November? Google released the picture uh, identification on Picasa, right? Now, if you've got, you upload all your digital fit photos to Picasa and you tag them, you know, this is Julie. Well, now the software can go through and take all the other faces that look like Julie and tag them as well. Right? You say, wait a minute, that's free. How can, <laughs> I didn't know there was free, you know, uh, visual face identification software. Well, yeah, it's been out now for a few months. Okay? And that's how this stuff works, right? One by one, our computers pick up higher and higher level capacities that we thought only people could do. Okay? Why is that? Because you and I, since we picked up that first stone, we're taking our higher intelligence and we're putting it into our technology. We're externalizing it. That is us. Right? It's pieces of us that just work better and better over time. Don't be afraid of it. Right? It's you. And the last thing, that brings up our last word, intimacy. <clears throat> Technology trends today, several futurists will argue, suggest that our technologies are becoming more and more intimately connected to us. Right? Remember one laptop per child? Right? Well, I think they got that wrong. Right? It should have been one cell phone per child. Because a cell phone is even more intimately connected to you. Right? This little guy right here, the, the new Google Android, um, it has voice app now since November. You guys know what voice app for iPhone is? For iPhone and the Android? Both of the, both the spiderings, the, the index 
indexes, the token indexes for the words, and the voice recognition software is not on your phone, it's on a server that you talk to through your phone. Okay. That's how it works. Now, this thing is so good. If you have an iPhone or an Android, you know, I've been using it for the last uh, month or so. You say, population of Uganda. Three, four seconds later, the first Google link pops up. And as you can imagine, that, that cache is that cash buried underneath the link. It's the population of Uganda. Or you say, Vietnamese restaurants in South Bend. The first link is a Yelp link, you know, with all those user rankings for Vietnamese restaurants in South Bend. The second link is a Google Maps link with a bunch of those Google Maps yellow pins distributed around the geographic center of South Bend. Or if you say Vietnamese restaurants near B, you don't even need to say South Bend because these things have whatever. A GPS chip. So it's context sensitive search, right? Now, Google is selling location based ads on the side of the search thread. Google's going to put one of these in every kid's hand. Google and all the other players, right? Within the next 10 years. And I want you to think about a world where every kid as fast as the curiosity horizon just by talking to the oracle. Because that's what this is, right? This is a collection of all the knowledge of all human beings. It's the greatest single infrastructure project our species has ever been involved in. And it's turning into what I just described as a conversational interface. If you Google the phrase conversational interface, you'll find, and you can find something lucky, You'll find my article here on 2003. Because that's a really interesting future event, isn't it? Now, there's a lot of positives, there's a lot of upsides, and there's a lot of downsides to putting a cell phone in everybody's hand. One of the downsides is about 3 billion new human beings are going to come onto this planet in the next 30 years. 95% of them are going to come on in what kind of an environment? Social, economically, politically. A third world slum. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be able to see on their little shiny little G phone all the cargo everybody has that they don't have. Now, about a billion and a half people live in these things called favelas. They don't even own, they don't even have a right to be there. They're squatters, right? On these kind of cardboard houses, right? Or these paper mache houses, right? In these slums, like in Brazil. They're in a very delicate balance between petty crime and petty capitalism. That's how they survive. Okay? We better make sure that we tip them over into capitalism tip them over into participation in the system and not, and not demonstrating against it. How many people know what semteto is? Semteto is without roof. It's a term that's used in Brazil for squatters, people who don't have roofs. They go in and they take over abandoned buildings because they think they should have a roof. And if the water fails in the abandoned buildings, do you know what these guys do? If they can't, if they can't get basic water... Or, or plumbing, things like that. They actually have gone up five, a thousand, 500, 1,000 of these squatters have gone into supermarkets and they've just stripped them clean of all the water. They don't take anything else. They just take all the bottled water. Right? That's civil disobedience. Right? 
They're saying, listen, we're not asking for a lot. We just want the basic right to survive. Right? Now, you might think, oh, that's terrible. That could easily get out of hand. It could turn into chaos. Or you might think, hey, that's great. They're going to force people to finally deal with population and, and infrastructure problems in these third world countries. Right? Depending on how you frame that, it says a lot about your view of the world, doesn't it? The point is, this is the kind of world we're moving to. We're moving to a world where there's incredible computational capacity, and there's too many of us on the planet, and we have to figure out how to live sustainably with the planet, right? The other thing I'm going to throw out in this discussion is I'm going to suggest that there's three fundamental ways of looking at complex systems, okay? Evolution, which is all about creativity. Development, which is all about sustaining the system that exists, right? A developmental system. It's all about conserving that cycle, protecting, okay? And then their intersection, which is learning. That's information, right? So you can look at the complex system as a learning system, as a creating system, and as a sustaining system. And so now we understand why I titled this uh, talk Innovation, Learning, and Sustainability. Because in my worldview, those are the three fundamental attributes of complex systems. They create, they learn, and they protect or they sustain. Right? And everything else that we think about, I think, is just a blend of these three things. Okay? And that's my particular worldview. Right? So let's take a quick quiz and get a sense of where we are in terms of acceleration. So we'll take the 100 top economies in the world. These are systems that generate income. Right? And they could, that could be a multinational corporation that brings in revenue, or it could be a country that brings in tax revenue, right? The 100 largest economic entities in the world. What percentage do you guys think are corporations? Somebody, let me guess. 70, that's a pretty good guess. It's actually 76, yeah. Uh -huh. this, was, this was actually 2005, so it's probably higher now. Right? Now, your father's world... That wasn't true, okay? 1950s, right? It was, it was actually mostly countries, okay? Everything changed after the 50s. Why? Because of computers, because of these technologies of scale that we talked about, right? Cheap transportation, cheap communication, right? Countries can't keep growing their citizens, but corporations keep growing their consumer base, right? So what does this say? This says that, the, the, that most of the largest revenue-generating entities in the world are corporations. So if you care about sustainability, what's more important, political reform or corporate reform? I mean, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Right? We've got to make sure these corporations are environmentally, socially responsible. Right? I'm not saying anything other than that. Right? It's just a very basic observation. How many of the lowest net worth Americans would it take to approximate Bill Gates' net worth in 2005. So there's just under 300 million Americans in, in uh, 05. How many? Now, you remember, the lowest net worth, many of them are negative. Because right? <laughs> the corporations have convinced them to live way beyond their means. Right? So they're complete debt slaves to the world. Right? Their, their foresight has been completely bled out by the system. Right? So you've got to balance those off against the other people who are just barely getting by. How many people? How many? On, on the scales, how many? You've got Bill Gates over here, and you got how many Americans? 90? Yeah, it's actually worse than that. It's 110 million Americans. Now, again, how you respond to this depends on your friend. You may say, that's great. We live in a society where if you win big, you can win so big, you could become bigger than most countries. Right? And that's kind of cool. But on the other side, you could say, you know what? I don't, I don't necessarily trust Bill Gates in how he's going to distribute that wealth. I'd like to make sure, let's say, that once he dies, most of that wealth comes back to the society that he got it from. Right? And that's another frame, isn't it? It's the frame that I happen to think is, more, is, is pretty important. Right? Because it's great to make a lot of money, but how do you distribute that money? Right? And, and how much differential do you want in a society between the highest paid CEO and the lowest paid worker, right? 30, 40, 50? Do we have a number? I think we should have a number. 
I think we should report a number in our annual reports, okay? That's a, a, a corporate social responsibility initiative, right? Understanding, knowing that multiplier, okay? All right, Disney and Sony respectively produce and launch one new product every what? Anybody? What would you think? Yeah, that's it. It's down to minutes, exactly. Right? And, you know, this is old. This is 05, right? I'm sure these numbers are going down because there's so many things you can just push out as informational products onto the web. Right? And those technologies for customizing all that, those informational products just get better and better and more and more automated. Remember that automation word? Right? So this is a pretty fast-paced world we live in, isn't it? Right? And it's something we want to think about. We're going to get insight into this, right? So the topics of this, of this talk are foresight development, evolution in development, that Evo Info Devo Triad I just showed you. We're going to come back to that. Something I call sustainable innovation, which is the intersection of evolution and development. You can't just have sustainability, and you can't just have innovation. You've got to have both. And that phrase, sustainable innovation, is actually a paradox. Just think about that, right? It's two opposing forces. And that's what evolution and development are. They're opposing fundamental forces that have to work together. Okay? And then we're going to talk a little bit about accelerating change, automation and technology, trend curves. We're probably going to skip this because we're going to run out of time. And then I'm going to end, end you with some scenarios. Since I'm a futurist, I'm going to end with kind of two big scenarios for thinking about the future. Okay? In your lifetimes... Right? What you guys are going to see, 2020 to 2050, that's a really interesting period, I think. Okay? Things are going to start to get really interesting around 2020. Right? One of the reasons is that conversational interface I told you about. That thing's going to get really smart all of a sudden. It's going to, start, it's going to stay pretty, pretty primitive, like what I just described, restaurants. and If you want show times right now, right? they just pop up. They're the first thing. I le there's more and more new things I can do just by speaking to the Oracle every week. It's going to be more and more new things every day, every hour around 2010. That's going to be a real, or 2020. That's going to be a real interesting time. Right? So we have to start thinking about, well, how do we want to garden that? What kind of values do we want to bring to that world? Okay? Because it's going to be a very fungible world. That means very malleable, palpable. We can shape it. Technology, you set a bar for technology, it jumps over it. Humans don't do that. Right? We have our habits, right? Technology does. How many people know what take-back legislation is? In Germany, for example, where it started, I think. But it's all through Europe. It's, cr it's called Cradle to Cradle Recycling. It's a great book called Cradle to Cradle. It's two great books on sustainability I'd like to suggest you read. One is called Natural Capitalism by Paul Hawken. The other one's called Cradle to Cradle by uh, William McDonough. A Cradle to Cradle is when you produce a product you should have responsibility, if it's a big product particularly, for recycling that whole thing at the end, taking it back. Okay? That's what take-back legislation is. Now, anything larger than a washing machine, I think, in Europe, the manufacturers have to be able to take it back, recycle it. All the solar panels that are being made in Europe, 17 solar pan panel manufacturers got together last year and decided to take them all back at the end of life because they have to comply to the, with these rules. Even small ones where they don't have to comply, they still got together to do this. How do we do it in the United States? We have one solar panel manufacturer called First Solar. They set up a trust in case they go bankrupt so that their products can be recycled at the end. None of the other ones are doing it. So it shows you two different cultural approaches, doesn't it? Europe is probably 10, maybe 20 years ahead of us in terms of thinking about sustainability of products at the political level. And when they set those take-back re regulations, all the manufacturers complained, oh, it's going to be too hard, too difficult. We're not going to be competitive globally. Well, guess what? Within five, six years, they, they started exporting that recycling technology to other, country, other uh, cor corporations in other countries. It turned out to be much easier to do than people said. Why? Because it wasn't people doing it. It was the machines, it was the technology, it was the automation systems. You set a bar for technology, it's going to jump over it. You want clean nuclear? 
You set that bar. You don't want nuclear at all because you're worried about nuclear proliferation? Then set the bar another level. Right? But the important point is the technology is going to learn a whole lot faster than humans. We just have to have the political will and the vision to decide what kind of future we want. Right. Foresight development. What is it and why do you want it? Well, foresight is an attempt to improve our ability to anticipate, create, and manage change. We can think of it in terms of various domains like science and tech, environment, economy, various levels, personal to universal, and various disciplines or specialties, theories and methods. Okay? It's a difficult yet a worthy challenge. Right? Now, I would argue there's three primary domains we can think about foresight. Future studies, the possible, probable, and preferable futures, the three Ps as they call it. Development studies, which are things that are developmentally inevitable because like, like us, our developing body, the whole planet is on a developmental trajectory. Right? That is a hypothesis. I'm waving my arms. I can't prove that, but I can statistically give you lots and lots of evidence for it. Okay? And then you have to decide, is it true? Is the planet not just evolving, evolving creatively and unpredictably, but is it also developing? Once you, create, once you get the first uh, wheel, once you get electricity, once you get the internet, could you ever go back? It doesn't look like evolution to me. That looks like development. And then a subset of development studies that we call acceleration studies, things that not only develop in one direction, they're ir irreversible statistically, on average, but they go faster and faster every year because they're, they're taking advantage of these efficiencies that are built into the universe. Right? And that's a really special, weird little subset. Right? And I think these three are the big ways to look at the future, and I think they're all important. And you might say to me, John, you're wrong. Things aren't, you know, cultures aren't developing. Well, then you have to explain to me Ron Englehart and the World Values Survey, okay, which basically charts all world values on two dimensions. Uh, secular, rational, and self-expression, and shows the whole world moving to the upper right corner. Now, we all go various evolutionary paths, different ways, right? Just a random Brownian motion on the way up to the upper right corner, but that's where we go. And by the way, secular, rational here doesn't mean non-religious at all. What it means in Englehart's term is tolerant, truly tolerant of all the other religious uh, perspectives. Okay? Coexisting with increased diversity over time and subdiversities within all the major religions, right? Increased diversity. It's just like evolution, right? More and more branching. Right? That's what it means, right? Now, a futurist is someone who looks to and provides analysis of the future. You can divide it into social types. Um, professional teachers, anyone who takes money for talking about the future. Since I guess I'm getting a speaker's fee, that makes me one of those, right? would also be someone who's, who writes a science fiction book that you read because you want to know what they think about the future, right? Maybe anybody who takes money for any approach for thinking about the future. There's imaginative, agenda-driven, corporate futurists, consensus-driven people like at the UN, right? There's six different social types and six different methodological types that we've found. Now, in terms of theories and methods that futurists use, well, there's a huge number. I mean, we broke it down into 48. This list has since grown about 50. 50 uh, different primary and secondary foresight specialties. Now, primary are things where you can't go and get a degree in them, but they're, but they're futures. So if, you, if any people have heard of prediction markets, right? A prediction market is a primary specialty in future studies, and you can't get a degree in it. People who do road mapping, people who do scenario planning, okay? If you can, if you can only get a degree in this from... You can only get a degree in these things from 15 places in the world today, unfortunately. Get a primary master's or PhD degree. Okay? Because primary future studies isn't really that big. Now, I got a master's from the University of Houston. It's one of those 15 places. I would love to see a lot more of these places because I think these are important skills. These are all very important skills also for thinking about the future. But they're secondary because you can get degrees in them from other academic environments. So if you get a degree or a master's or a PhD in future studies, you should study these, but you should also know that there's experts out there that you can work with who, who already study those. Okay? But there's still a whole bunch of stuff that um, is important to future thinking that you can't get degrees in, except from those 15 places. 
Now, what's interesting is you can divide those skills very nicely into three categories. Tools and methods for thinking about the possible future. Tools and methods for thinking about the probable future. Remember that development studies and acceleration studies, the stuff I was talking about? Predictable stuff. And then tools and methods for navigating towards the preferable future, the kind of future you want. Right? And most of them, there's a few, the majority, slight majority, are in the preferable future space, as we would hope. That's good, because we want a lot of tools for creating the kinds of futures that we all collectively want. And notice how I use the word futures with an S, right? Because that's the kind of a world that we live in. There's a tremendous diversity in our world, and that cultural and subcultural diversity is just going to keep going up because of evolution. Right? So these foresight skills can be broken down again into just these three simple categories, these three simple bins. We create the possible future, we discover the probable future, and we manage towards the preferable future. And when you get a management degree here at Mendoza, right, you're going to do a lo use a lot of management tools. You're going to use some creation tools and some discovery tools, but it's mostly going to be focused on management. Right? So there's a cone of possible futures. And what a, what a futurist is basically doing, what anybody who uses foresight is basically doing, right, is they're sorting their stories. You're telling stories about your future, and you're sorting them into these categories, right? The impossible. People are still going to tell that story, though, because it's so interesting. What if we could have time travel, right? It's a joke, right? Impossible. Right? I shouldn't say it's a joke, but it's, it goes against all the physics that all the majority of people think, right? The implausible futures, well, that just might happen, but it's pretty implausible. The plausible futures, yeah, there's a number of people who believe that could happen. And the possible futures divide into these two. Then there's the probable futures. Computers are going to get faster. Okay, I can pretty much guarantee that. And then there's the preferable futures. What kind of futures do we want? And notice how this space um, includes a little bit of the, uh, a lot of the probable some of the possible, and a little bit of the impossible. Because a good manager is not just setting stretch goals for you, things that you can reach if you stretch, but they're actually setting a few goals that are physically impossible. And you only find that out by beating your head against the wall and seeing what the universe gives you. And that's the preferable space. So thinking about this, you want to have a course. Now, Tom here has a course the Junior Challenge course. This is a required undergraduate course for all the business students here at Notre Dame. 600, 500, 600 of them a year. It's a wonderful idea. Guess what? Ta uh, Tam Kang University in Taiwan started that back in 1995. They actually have 15 courses on the future, and you have to choose a Chinese menu if you pick three of those. So future of the environment, my personal futures, you know, career futures, uh, um, technology futures, whatever you want. And I created a course that all 1,400 undergrads at this university in Arizona have to take. That's a lot like Tom's Junior Challenge course. Now, I think these are wonderful courses. They should be required. If you have to take a course in history in the general ed community, not just School of Business, but every university, if you have to take a course in history, why shouldn't you have to take at least one course in thinking about the future? Okay. And that's what I'm arguing. Okay. And there's a group of us, Foresight Education and Research Network, of futures educators who are trying to get these up at more and more schools. Right. And so now back to my personal philosophy on, on change, right? As, as, a, as one futurist coming here to talk to you guys. I think evolution and development are the two fundamental processes we need to think about. So I created a community uh, actually last year, January of last year, it's an international research community. There's about 45 scholars in it now. We've had one conference last year, Paris, another one next year, no, this year. And we look at, and if you go to evodevouniverse.com, you'll find the people uh, in this community who want to look at universal change from the perspective of these two fundamental, potentially fundamental processes, evolution and development, right? How many people know what the second law of thermodynamics is? Anybody? Come on, somebody. So what, so what, what goes up in the universe because of the second law? 
Entropy. Right. Now, does that sound like evolution to you or development? Is that, is, that, is that an evolutionary choice? Or is that all roads lead to Rome? What do you think? It's all roads lead to Rome, isn't it? I would argue there's a number of things like that that we can look at at the universal level that are development. Right? So, a tentative definition for evolution is that it's stochastic, which means it's random, within constraints, and it creates a variation, and it's intrinsically unpredictable. Right? A tentative definition for development is that it's directional, it's predictable, and it's cyclical. Right? If you want to understand the difference between the two, look at biology. Okay? The argument here is that we live in a universe that is kind of like Teilhard de Chardin, the Jesuit priest from the 1950s, said... It's kind of like uh, engaging in what he called cosmic embryogenesis. So it's kind of like a seed. Okay? As a seed unfolds into an organism in an environment, there's totally unpredictable aspects of that, and there's totally predictable aspects of that. Right? And probably the best way to understand this is what I was, that analogy I was mentioning earlier, those two genetically identical twins. So you look at these two girls up close, and everything about them that matters is different. Their fingerprints, their retinal patterns, the way their brains are wired up, none of that stuff is specified in the genes. It's all this selectionist, adapt, adaptive, stochastic process. But you look at them from across the room, look at them, they look almost the same, don't they? They go through puberty at the same time, they live roughly the same lifespan, they have... They're 50, 60% psychologically correlated if you separate them at birth. Bring them together, they're a little less than 50% because all those genetic, you know, individuation mechanisms kick in. I'm not going to be like her. <laughs> but still, they have incredible, incredible similarities. Right? Developmentally. Right? Whoa, what the heck just happened? All right. We just did a huge jump there. All right. So the argument is... These are the two fundamental processes. Development, our universe is undergoing these, these predictable things and these unpredictable things. So the crazy, crazy diagram is, here's our right hand and our left hand of change, right? You get experimentation, evolution. You get convergent unification, that's development, that's hierarchy. And you get their interaction, which is what the evolutionists call natural selection. It's based on two far more fundamental things. Right? You can find examples of this at every level of universal scale. For the physicists in the room, there's something called quantum Darwinism, which basically says that the way the, the classical world of physics that you and I are in, with predictable things like gravity, okay, that's pretty developmental, isn't it? You think you can, you think you can repeal that one? <laughs> no way. Right? That world comes out of a process of quantum, what's called Ein selection, a process of quantum selectionism, a competitive process. Turns out that's the way our brains wire up as well, a completely competitive and stochastic process called, driven by something the, the neurologists call activity theory. Right? And that's where the concept of memes, right? fundamental replicating ideas in a culture, are... Uh, is another evo-devo concept, right? So we have genes in our, bio in our bodies and we have memes in our brains. Okay? There's even some cosmologists that say our entire universe is engaging in a process called cosmological natural selection. If you want more on that, this book by Smolin is fantastic. Right? So the basic argument is you hear words like, this, like unpredictably, randomness, indeterminacy, creativity, possibilities, branching, chance, accidental, bottom-up, these are all evolutionary words. We use them in our language every day. And words like necessity, conservative, sustainability, convergent, integration, cyclic, irreversible, constraints, destiny, stability, sameness, self-organizing, top-down, long-term, hierarchical. Those are developmental words. Right? So you say, well, we're creating the future. We're talking in terms of evolution. You say, oh, we're discovering the laws of the universe that determine the future. 
Now you're talking about development. See how you can go to two different places in your head? And they're both correct. Right? So this brings us back to the topic of our, our lecture series, which is sustainability versus innovation. You can't talk about one without the other. You can't have sustainability without continued innovation. Right? That's how the system seems to work. And likewise, you can't have innovation. If you, have, if you try to create an entirely innovative culture, you do it at the cost of sustainability. And a lot of people would say that's what you know, global capitalism 1.0 is, is it's way too far tipped into innovation, needs to be tipped back into a mix of innovation and sustainability. Can't go all the way to sustainability. Why? Because you're not going to stop innovation. You're not going to stop that conversational interface that I talked about. That's not going to happen. Okay? Because the universe seems to be too well, design, too well designed, structured, whatever word we want to use, for us to continue to discover interesting things about it and apply those to the human world okay? to create benefit. Right? Now, you, you, can apply, you can take this evo devil model as far as you want. You can, it helps you understand the difference between Republicans and Democrats okay? and why those two parties, you see them in so many cultures. You see these, this liberal conservative, two fundamental, it's a fundamental dyad in so many cultures. The Republicans in it are about, they're all about development, maintenance, tradition on social political, right? Keeping it the same, sustaining, protecting. And they're all about evolution, innovation, and freedom on economic issues. What about the Dems? They're exactly flipped, aren't they? They're all about complete innovation and freedom on social political issues, and all about development, maintenance, tradition, right? Sometimes, you know, give me, you know, nanny state, give me everything, right? On economic issues, right? It's fascinating, isn't it? Two fundamental ways, and they're both valuable ways of looking at the world. They split that demographic right down the middle. Right? That's why they're so... Uh, they're they're so, such persistent uh, uh, parties, okay, or, or philosophies. So this Evo Info Devil Triad. Here's our our crazy diagram again, right? I'm arguing creating, learning, and sustaining are these three fundamental parameters, right? And in our society today, we really don't balance these three out. If you think about the way we approach them. For the first five years of our life, it's all about creativity. Then they get to school, and it's all about learning. And they forget creativity, they forget creativity and they forget uh, um, sustainability. Right? You, don't, you don't plan for your future. Right? You don't learn how to protect the things that matter. You don't have values or civics conversations in most schools. Fortunately, there are exceptions, like, like Notre Dame, right? And then when we get to uh, the job, it's all about sustainability. But it's a very narrow definition of the term. Organizational sustainability, economic sustainability, status quo sustainability. It's not planetary, right? It's not national or global sustainability. Right? And if we really thought about this triad, we would make sure that at all levels, like in the Montessori school, you're going to learn, you're not going to just get creativity, you're going to get um, um, learning and you're going to get uh, sustainability, right? And in, in some schools, you're going to get uh, not just learning, you're going to get um, uh, lifelong learning, a model for lifelong learning. So when you graduate, you realize, you know what, okay, I got the credential, but I haven't stopped learning. What a joke. Right? right. So some of the implications of this framework, if it's true for us, is that history can, our history, present, and future can be rewritten as evolutionary choices and developmental forces. Right? And the learning or simulation increase that we get from their interaction. Okay? And that we're moving towards this, this concept, this paradox that we call sustainable innovation. It will help us explain what hierarchy and acceleration are in our universe, how we move from less complex structures to more complex structures. So that's a developmental concept. It's also evolutionary, but it's largely developmental. And how we're, why we're moving from this outer space world of galaxies being the most interesting things to this inner space world of now this thing between our ears is the most interesting thing on the planet or in the universe. Right? Why are we doing that, going from outer to inner? Now, that's part of that acceleration. Right? So 
a speculation you can get from this is who you are in relation to the universe is, well, you're a very complex and special piece of the universe, evolved and developed by the universe. You're here to create, sustain, and understand the universe from your own perspective. And you're here to form unproven beliefs, tentative philosophy, and proven science about those things you don't understand. And I like this. I like this way of looking at things because, look, it's got faith, okay? It's got science, and it's got the stuff in the middle, philosophy, which is just stories. That's all philosophy is, okay? They're stories, plausible stories, okay? And these really are the basic ways that we approach complexity. When we're trying to get towards a global goal of sustainable innovation, well, first thing we discover is, you know what? This didn't exist in the past. Okay? It was a pretty unsustainable... Uh, the leading edge of complexity on the planet has always been pretty unsustainable. What's this right here? This is the Fertile Crescent. This was it. This was the, this was the hot stuff. Okay? Back 2300 B.C. And, and then what happened? 6000 B.C. to about 500 B.C. This was the cradle of civilization. We completely overgrazed it, overfarmed it, right? Salt rises in the soil. What's it now? It's a desert. Okay? That's the leading edge of culture. It's a desert. Burned itself out like a flame. And then where did it go? Well, then it went to places like um, the edge of the Mediterranean. It went to Nab Nabatea. How many people saw the um, Indiana Jones with this? Was that, was, remember that at the end? One of those Indiana Jones movies? Well, guess what? This was a beautiful civilization back in uh, 4,000 B.C. to 400 current era. Okay? Where did it all go? Why is it, why is it just a, a desert with this really cool um, structure down in the canyon? Well, these, these little guys, these rock hyraxes, they actually create burrows that are vegetation time capsules. And we've dated, we've carbon dated all these rocks, rock hyrax burrows, and we know that there used to be all kinds of trees and vegetation around Nabatea. And they just ripped it all away. They overgrazed it. They overfarmed it. Then they couldn't sustain themselves. You think, well, this doesn't happen in, you know, the Indians never did this. American Indians. Yes, they did. That's what Chaco Canyon and uh, Mesa Verde are. Chaco Canyon here, there's 100,000 timbers they used in creating these pueblos. They took them from all the local area, created this beautiful thing, just like the Mayans. This is a repeat of the, little, of the Mayans right here. Okay? Have you ever read, heard of the book called Collapse by Jared Diamond? It's about complex societies and how they can suddenly collapse because they become unsustainable. Well, that's what Chaco Canyon is. You want to go see these beautiful things in, the, in New Mexico? And you'll understand what they are. They're completely unsustainable acceleration. And these, remember, were the leading edge of the culture. So what am I just, what am I saying to you? I'm telling you a story. I'm saying the leading edge of the system always has to be unsustainable. Thank goodness the whole system doesn't. But the leading edge, that's always going to be burning. It's going to be too far into the innovation and not enough into the sustainability side. Right? How else can you explain that the leading edge of culture starts in Fertile Crescent, moves to Babylon, Egypt, Greece, go to Rome, Spain, France, Britain for a little while, that's the leading edge. It jumps to America, try to jump the pond to Japan, that was too temporary back in the 90s, remember that? Remember those, oh, Japan's going to be the leader, too small, right? And now it's jumping to China, right? They're trying to repeat this Singapore-style autocratic capitalist revolution, right? Where they do economic liberaliz liberalization first, and then what happens next? What's the next part of the shoe, the second shoe, after economic and technological liberalization? What comes next? Social and political liberalization. And we go, oh, that's weird. There's something wrong with that, because we did the social political first, and then the economic. It's just a different way of doing it. And if you want to understand where the rights are going to be in China in another 30 years, look at Singapore. Right? Now they have women's rights. Now they have a youth culture that is far more free and doesn't care so much about, uh, um, and does their own thing. Right? And that's, that's what happens when you get a developed society. It turns into something a little like us. Right? So... And you think, oh gosh, you know, the U.S. has 50,000 high school kids a year going into their science fairs. China has 6 million kids going into their science fairs a year. That's, oh, that's like, you go, oh, that's, that's kind of terrible. But you know what? 
Science is a strongly positive sum game. That's a Chinese science researcher who discovers a cure to cancer, you know, two, five years from now, to the cancer that I'm going to get in 20 years. That's my best friend. Okay? Strongly non-zero sum game, science is. Right? So, China's the next economic frontier. It's a great book. I recommend on it. The average annual GDP growth rate is 9.5%. It's dropped a little bit now because of the recession, but only two points. There, this is average, by the way. So while the, the, urban, the rural areas are really, really slow, the leading cities, their GDP growth is 20% a year. And it's been like that for over 15 years. Can you imagine that? That's how fast economic growth is occurring on our planet. The leading edge. And of course, these are the least sustainable. China is the least sustainable environment right now. All these people are going to come on with their cars. You probably heard this before, right? All these people that are going to have cars and, and all the CO2 that's going to go in the atmosphere. And we better darn well make sure that those cars are electric hybrids as quickly as possible, right? We better make that technology as environmentally sustainable as we can because the people are not going to change their habits nearly as fast. Right. Back to this population issue that we described, right? It looked for a while, a positive feedback loop, it looked for a while like it was going to go vertical, right? Oh, terrible, right? We're going to have some, just a terrible future. And then it started leveling off. And now, in every developed country, population growth is actually negative. Do you guys know that? The only reason we're growing is because of immigration from less developed countries. And within the next 50 years, every other culture in the world is going to go negative. So that's why the best demographers say that we're going to actually hit a max around 9 billion, 9 to 10 billion. And then it's going to start either level off flat or it's going to start actually going negative. Why? Because in every developed world, it's valuable for you to have 1.5, 1.6, less than the 2.1 kids per couple, that is a replacement rate, because that gives you more options for personal and child development. And that's a better kind of a future. That's a sustainable future. So now we can see we just got to get past this hump, don't we? We got to get past this situation between now and 2050 when things start to look controllable again. Right? One big question is, is world energy use going to continue to explode? Here's a wonderful paper from 1988 that, that describes the two different scenarios. I am going to argue that this is the scenario. Just like population flatlining, total world energy use is going to flatline. Right? This, is an, this is a minority hypothesis right now, but I think it's a better hypothesis. I think it more accurately fits the data. And that's good because... We have a colossal sustainability problem. If we wanted to build what's called Renewistan, you know, something that, size, uh, something that would give us enough renewable energy to deal with our CO2 emission problem, it would have to be the size of Australia today with all of the um, solar power and wind and geothermal and all the other plants that would have to go in, solar power being the biggest, the solar panels, right? That's how big it would have to be. And you think, well, that's not possible. That, that's right, it's not possible. Because we're not, we're not going to stop at 450 ppm on carbon. We're going to go past it. And we better hope that's not going to create a terrible greenhouse planet. But we don't have the technology yet to store that carbon. Wouldn't it be nice if we could raise or lower that carbon CO2 atmospheric thing in the, in the, uh, in the atmosphere like a thermostat? Wouldn't it be great if our species had that technological capacity? Go into an ice age, oh, we put a little more CO2 in. If it's a little too warm, oh, we pull it back down. But you know what? We haven't got that capacity yet. Regardless of your opinion on global warming, whether or not it's caused by CO2, we absolutely should have the ability to raise or lower CO2 levels as a species. And we like uh, Sokolo and Pakala, a beautiful paper from 2004 that described the wedges we're going to need. These stabilization wedges. Each one of these wedges in the strategy gets rid of the CO2 problem. Right? And there's really good data that when a society gets uh, above uh, 25,000 GDP, uh, GDP per capita, it doesn't consume more energy. It flatlines. The United States has been flat at 300 gigajoules per person for about 30 years. Europe has been flat 
um, at 150 gigajoules per person for about 20 years. And that's the whole difference. We, you know, they look at us and say, we're terrible energy, use, energy wasters because we use twice as much energy per person than they do. That's true. But it's also true that both of these countries have been flat in their energy use per person for almost between two and three decades. And that's a positive thing, isn't it? Because what it says is that eventually everyone's going to go flat. And as long as we can continue to have accelerating efficiencies in our technologies, and we don't have accelerating numbers of people on the planet, the whole system becomes eventually manageable. Right? And there's lots of fantastic technologies that are coming online that are going to create that incredible uh, efficiency. Solid state lighting is just one, one great example of it. Have you ever seen those, those stoplights that have the little, the little pinprick LEDs? Right? Uh, we have a technology called organic LED that's coming to our uh, computer screens. Unbelievably energy efficient. Right? Going to replace all these lights with these flat white LEDs. Ridiculously energy efficient. Okay? And that's because of these technologies of interspace, these nanotechnologies we described. If you're interested in that, go into, you know, go into the science and engineering of that stuff because there's going to be great things happening. Another example is these nano batteries. Okay? They were an announced by Toshiba in 2005. This is a battery that recharges 80% in 60 seconds. Wouldn't it be nice to have that for your electronics? Oh, my cell phone's not working. I go to Starbucks, I stick it in the little jack, right? 60 seconds later, eight of those 10 green bars, eight of those 10 bars are green again. Right? That's the kind of world we're going to. Okay? And that's because of nanotechnology. They just put a nanostructured lattice at the cathode and the anode, and they figured out that they could push the ion so fast that the, the, the batteries don't blow up. And not only that, the batteries last five times longer. You say, oh, John, this is a fantasy technology. No, it's not. This is actually out. It's been out for six months. Many people have heard of DeWalt power tools. De right, okay. DeWalt now uses batteries from a company called A123 Systems in uh, MIT spinoff. These batteries last five times longer than the ordinary rechargeables. And you can charge them immediately and they don't blow up. You have to have a high amperage charger to do it. So people are taking these DeWalt batteries, they're the only nano batteries that are currently out, and they're ripping them, they're, they're, they're uh, putting them into the, their electric bikes. <laughs> and you can go on YouTube and see people just ripping it around town in their electric bikes with these DeWalt power tools, you know, batteries, okay? Five years from now, they're going to be, you know, everyone's going to have them, right? That's how it works. So a lot of incredible possibilities. There might come a time with a nano battery that you're going to be able to recharge your plug-in hybrid at the gas station you know, in 10 minutes while you're getting a cup of coffee. And now you're getting 70 cents a mile a gallon equivalent electricity for another 40, 100 miles, depending on how, how many, what your battery capacity is. Okay? And that's a much greener future. Much, much greener future. And that's coming. Okay? You think... Okay, John, you've been positive and optimistic about all this stuff. There's got to be some downsides to this. Well, sure there are. I mean, here's one. Okay. Toyota announced a car. This is a, this is a lightweight Prius that uh, gets 100 miles per gallon. And at the same time that they announced this car last year at the Tokyo Auto Show, they went with all of the big uh, car makers to the U.S. government to lower the corporate average fuel economy standards for 2020, the target, to lower them from 35 to 32 miles per gallon. They said, oh, it's too hard. By 2020, we can't, we can't do 35. We, 32 is the best we can do. Meanwhile, they have a car coming out next year, the Prius, that gets 50 miles to the gallon, right? Now, why did they do that? Why did Toyota do that? With one hand, they're, they're breaking all the laws and standards and, and, and getting out of the the restraints. And on the other hand, they're announcing this wonderful 100 mile per gallon car. The reason they're doing it is because they don't have to make that 100 mile per gallon car. There's nobody forcing them to. They've already convinced you they are the renewable energy leader. Right? They're already the biggest car company. Big companies don't have to innovate. What they do is it's called innovate and wait. They innovate and then they patent it and sit on it until they're forced to innovate by a small, a midsize or a small company. So the real innovators in any society are always the midsize and the small companies. Right? And that's one of the downsides, what's totally realistic. And unfortunately, in a brand-hypnotized society, 
we think the big guys, they're the most innovative. But the smartest thing for you to do would be to buy one of those little electric cars, like the Tesla or the um, Fesker or the, um, what's that $40,000 one, uh, Phoenix, right? $40,000 electric truck coming out uh, two months from now, right, out of Los Angeles. If you buy one of those guys, as soon as there's 5% of the market that has that, all the big guys have to finally come out with that Chevy Volt. Instead of announcing it in 2010 and then dangling it and have it actually come out in 2015, they're going to actually have to come out with it in 2010. Because you hold their feet to the fire. That's how it works. Right? Here's another wonderful technology. Next time you get a, a bump in your car and you, go, you, know, you, can't, you can't read because, because you're feeling sick, you know, because the, the car is too bumpy, you think, well, couldn't they design a suspension system that gets rid of that problem? Well, guess what? They did. This guy... You ever heard, how many people know what, have heard of Bose? Remember him? MR Bose? The Bose suspension, Bose uh, audio systems, right? Well, he actually solved this problem with an electromagnetic suspension, but the way, this is a completely electromagnetic suspension. It's so ridiculously fast and smooth, you can't feel anything. They actually have to tune it so that you feel the speed bumps. That's how good it is. That's how quickly the cars lift their wheels and put them back down again. Okay? It's all sensors, actuators, automation. Now, Bose can sit on this technology for 17 years, the way our current patent system works, until someone is willing to pay what he wants. He wants too much, so he's been sitting on it, according to the car companies, so he's been sitting on this technology uh, since 2000, for eight years. Right? And the way our patent system works, he can continue to renew his patents, not just 17 years, which is the way it should be, but even beyond that, because we don't have enough accountability in terms of innov the innovations that are created. Right? That's the way we have set the patent laws. Okay? So this is another one of those downsides. Another downside for you to understand is that in some countries, business systems working so well that the rich-poor divide is actually growing. And guess what? The United States, Great Britain, and Switzerland are the three worst examples of that. Three of the richest countries in the world, the rich-poor divide is growing the fastest, creating a two-class system here. Why are we doing that? Because those places are the world financial and economic headquarters. So the ultra-rich can just get so incredibly rich. And in every other developed country in the world, the rich-poor divide is still closing, rationalizing, becoming a more equitable system. Now... Does that mean, so this is called the great U-turn. So Google, look this up uh, if you want more of the statistics on this. And you say, well, does that mean the United States and Great Britain and Switzerland are kind of, that mean they're anomalies? They're not doing what the rest of the world is doing. Does that mean they're eventually, they're going to have to level off? I think so. But in the meantime, lots of things about the cult country that we love are actually getting worse. Right? This... Um, America's Perfect Storm by the Educational Testing Service, which came out last year, or in 07 actually, is a beautiful example of just how much worse our educational systems are getting in this country. Right? This isn't happening everywhere. In some of those countries where the rich-poor divide is a lot, close, is a lot um, narrower, their, their educational systems are much, much better. They value education a lot more. Right? So there's things that this country has to deal with to make it more economically and politically sustainable, if you think about it, from the perspective of other countries. If you care about innovation, here's two beautiful books. This book tells about how innovations diffuse only when the society is ready for them. And this book tells you why only medium-sized and small countries companies are the true innovators. And the big companies do everything they can to change the rules so they don't have to innovate. Okay? And that's just reality. And that's okay, because big companies are going to do things that little companies can't do. They're going to provide a lot of services to the world. So we have to recognize there's, for every size of country, of company, there is a value that's provided. The innovation value comes from the private companies and from the mid-sized to small companies. Why do big corporations that are public, why are they so uninnovative? because it's most economically valuable for them to innovate and wait. They, they grab it, they'll patent it, and they'll sit on it, and they'll make as much money as they can off of the old system. It's just how it works, right? It's just the smart thing for them to do. 
So what we're looking for is a world of sustainable innovation. How do we get there? Well, we have to look at books like this guy, Joseph Schumpeter, wonderful economist who talked about creative destruction. That's another one of those phrases that's an oxymoron, isn't it? Sustainable innovation, creative destruction. What is that? What, what Schumpeter said is that some countries have a very low creative destruction index. And that, that is if you look at, you look at, the, you look at their um, top 100 firms over 20 years. And 20 years later, um, a bunch of those firms should be gone. They should be merged. He says about half of those firms, 25 years later, should be gone. They should be merged with other companies, or they should actually have gone bankrupt. And all their assets have been transferred to a more efficient company. And he says that's a healthy environment because it balances evolutionary creativity and sustainability, status quo. The United States, actually, this is a good statistic, we're actually right in the middle on that. 50% of our companies disappear after about 25 years of the top, from that top 100 list. They're either knocked down to being much less profitable or they actually disappear entirely and are merged with others. Now, the country that has the most creative destruction right now is Asia. Those country, companies are continually uh, turning over. And countries that have the worst, the least, are Japan and old Europe. And they're, they're far too into protectionism for their largest companies, right? So they're going to be a lot less innovative, right? Let's see if I have a chance to go to that. Yeah. Mm. Ah, yeah, I'll do this one because it's, it's, it's good. So we're interested in sustainability. I'd like you guys to think about, think about this for a second. Have you seen these Dodge Sprinter vans? They're pretty nice little, little um, very, actually the second most um, fuel efficient uh, work truck in the, in, the, in the U.S. right now. They're made by Mercedes, rebadged by, uh, as Dodge over here, right? <clears throat> if you put 10 people in them, you get 210 passenger miles per gallon. Now that is significantly better than you'll get from a bus, and it's six times better than you'll get from a plane, which is only barely better than what a person, in, a solo person in their car gets. Right? Now I want you to ask you this question. You guys have taken shuttle buses to the airport, right? These are pretty amazing automated systems. They have GPS tracking them, uh, and the better ones, and the, the machine calls you half an hour beforehand, and then it calls you five minutes beforehand to make sure you're at the curb. Right. Now, you could use something like that for eight hours or less for all your local transportation. If you had free Wi-Fi, first-class seats for sleeping or working on them, and it would be a third the cost and five times better passenger MPG than, than planes. How many, how many people might do this? Just about every student out there, anybody who's in low income who wants to save money on a, on a, on a regional flight would take something like this instead because it's door to door, right? You can sleep, you can work, no TSA, total efficiency, right? Now, UPS is already put frames on these, this, is, this truck is just slightly larger, and that's the way you'd, you'd make something like this. You'd want five doors on each side, so that you basically open the door and you get into your own little tiny compartment. Right? You can close, up, close it off, put up the plastic blinders, you don't want to be complete, or you can pull it down if someone's sitting next to you want to talk to them. All your luggage goes up right above you, and you can see it through the little transparent roof, right? Don't have to worry about someone stealing it. You can lock it up, right? Now, uh, these things can run natural gas, which is 60% less CO2, and it's 80 cents less per, per gallon. Uh, myself and a couple other friends did the numbers on this, and we did this, uh, we did this about two, three years ago, and I am still amazed that this doesn't exist. It would save tens of billions of dollars in consumer savings and efficiencies. If you had a door-to-door -door inner city shuttle bus, you could pay a little bit higher for just five people. You could pay the highest and use it like a taxi. You could pay a little bit less and you have five people on the route, or students could pay, you know, for all nine, all nine people, they, could be, they would pay the least, right? Or they would wait the most. But still, they're getting useful stuff done while they're on this shuttle, right? It's got air shocks, it's got seat shocks, it's got springy seats. 
You can sleep, sleep back with a four-point harness like a, like, a, like a pilot uses if you want, right? Where is this thing? Right? This is innovation. Right? Any one of you out there could make this thing. Okay? And you could very significantly improve the world. Right? There's lots and lots of these examples out there. Why don't they exist? There's a lot of reasons. Probably the single greatest thing that would make this thing work, though, would be federal leadership. Subsidies and initial marketing to let everybody know that these things existed. Right? That would kick everything over. Now, until then, you have habit changes you've got to deal with. So only a big, well-funded company is going to go into it. Then they're only going to go into it if they can make a lot of money. Right? And that's the world we live in. Right? It's a complex world. Can we have that kind of federal leadership? Sure we can. Just have to sell the idea, right? Hopefully, you know, this administration we're in now seems very learning-oriented, and let's see if we see some of those kind of things happen. All right. Let's end on some examples. If we analyze change, we can look at it from an explicit level at sectors, and we can look at it at the implicit level, some of the capacities that go into the, the, infra, the uh, innovation, learning, and sustainability capacities that go into that system. So our values, the ones we actually have and the ones that we aspire to, that's part of that sustainability framework that we use. Right? That's how we are sustain ourselves. And then we have our, the infrastructure and knowledge and the power and wealth structures. And sociologists and anthropologists are going to explain the world this way. People who are more practically oriented, managers, politicians, they're going to explain the world this way. Right? From the implicit or the explicit frame. They're both important. So if we were to discuss some things that could be really valuable to the world, say President Obama was watching this, right? If I wanted to make a message to President Obama, what would I say? Well, I would say, let's look at these, let's look at these four areas from a perspective of innovation, learning, and sustainability and see if there's some things that are completely being neglected today. Let's look first at science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It's called STEM. Now, the point I want to make for this is that ever since we picked up that first rock, the greatest wealth that we're creating in the world is our application of technology to solving human problems. That's where wealth comes from. Not from these dollars, which are just a proxy. They're just an abstraction, a measure, an indirect measure of wealth. The real wealth that this country has, that this species has, is our, what's called our technical productivity, our science, technology, engineering mathematics, the things that we can have our machines do to solve problems that matter to us so that we can get on with the higher things in life that we care about, the more abstract, cultural, social, personal things. Right? So if we had a national report card on our technical productivity and we were measuring and reporting and talking about that a whole lot more than our GDP growth, we'd be in a much better position as a society. Okay? Our annual national and global growth in real technical wealth is far more important than growth in abstract economic wealth because money is, is a proxy. Technical productivity and the technological intelligence is concrete and it's our primary survival variable. It's how we're going to get out of this sustainability mess we're in today, right, is our STEM strength. Well, how do we get back as strong again as a country in terms of STEM? We were very strong in the Sputnik era, some of the older people in this uh, room, remember that, right? Just how strong our science and technology uh, enterprises got over an incredibly short period of time. We built the best universities in the world. You guys are sitting in one of them, right? Well, we have to get back to it by measuring that and caring about that, right? How strong are we on that? And how do we make that better? How do we get the schools, etc.? Economy. What's the biggest thing we could do from an innovation, learning, and sustainability standpoint for changing the economy. Well, the one I would argue is we've got to dethrone Wall Street. Okay? There, I said it. I've got business people in the room. Right? Well, guess what? 
70% of you guys are going to go out into private business. Wall Street doesn't cover that. That's the real business. That's the business that matters. Right? Private equity, private investment. 70-80% of the employment and the innovation happens in the private sector. So what is the public sector? It's the sector that makes the most money because it uses, leverages other people's money. So it gets the most, it's the fat head of the long tail. You heard of the long tail argument? Wall Street's the fat head, okay, 20%. It's a very important, but it's also only 20%. How do we dethrone it? Well, we have to improve our private equity markets. We have to give people access to those private equity, to investing in private companies, right? Which have a lot less reporting and can be a lot more long-term oriented, right? Big companies, public companies can't be. They have to be short-term oriented. Now, they're great. We need them. It's important to have, be able to have a, a, public, a comp company go public and come out of nowhere like Google or like Microsoft and be worth more than most countries in less than 10 years. That's valuable because for certain types of things, we want as much money as fast as we can. But let's remember that isn't the majority of the economy. The majority of the economy is uh, private business. So how about a 50% corporate tax reduction for U.S. manufacturing? Just chop the corporate taxes in half. If you make it here, that's going to incredibly incentivize local, national STEM. Okay? Science, technology, engineering, medicine. Right? If corporations use other people's money, make sure that they all have skin in the game. Everybody, every executive who's using other people's money, they have to have personal investments as well. So if the comp company goes down, a significant percentage of their personal investment has to go down as well. And that's just accountability, right? Transparency, accountability, these are simple things. We're not saying Wall Street's wrong. We're just saying it's not the most important thing, right? Governance. What can we do in governance? We can create an Excel-aware, acceleration-aware governance system, right? If we tie our global development to zero population growth, and technical productivity growth metrics, then we're going to be maximizing all the good things we can share with the world, but conditional on them keep it, keeping their population growth in balance, sustainable with their technical productivity. Right? And if we can solve that three, three and a half billion new kids coming on board in the next 30 years, that could be the greatest single thing that we could do as a govern, as a from a leadership position to improve the world, okay? State of the world in 2050, all right? <clears throat> Last thing I want to say is demographics. Since 911, we have not been immigrating. We've looked inward. Countries like Australia have done the opposite. They're immigrating. They're getting lots of wonderful new talent from Asia and other places. But the United States has gazed at our navels and has reacted, unfortunately, on this particular issue. Now, in other areas, we haven't. Right? We've met lots of challenges. We are doing our best to make the world a safer place. But we aren't immigrating anymore. And immigration is what made this country great. I want to remind everybody about, about that. Okay? If we immigrated 3 million of the best and the brightest, actually just 3 million people, and half of these people were best and the brightest around the world. The other half were just take all comers like we normally do. And we have... Um, we made 50% of that mer mer meritocratic, and we allowed as many formal paths to citizenship as possible. So the standard ones, PhD path to citizenship, if you create businesses, political asylum, etc. This would recognize that immigrants, first and second generation immigrants, they make incredible numbers of small businesses, they learn and they innovate way harder than you and I do, and that's just a fact of life. And all those kids out there, all those hungry kids who would love to come here participate in the American dream, make this world a better place, well, we could help them do that. We can keep our universities strong by having that perspective from the top down to innovate, learn, and sustain as strongly as we can. So that's, that's my spiel, and thanks very much for listening. Doesn't, doesn't, great point. It doesn't solve the problem in the short term. All it does is it gives you 
a, a good model for understanding that the problem eventually taps itself out, but how high and how uh, efficient are all of those machines that all these, all the cargo that all these uh, third world residents want to have, how efficient are those going to be? And that's a huge choice that we have. Again, we, have, we could do a lot of leadership on that. We could make sure that these cars that are being built in China and India are as efficient as, uh, as possible, have, as, have the ability to switch over to plug-in hybrid as quickly as possible. And I'm not so sure that CO2 emissions have leveled off in the developed world. All I know for sure is that energy emissions have leveled off. And how, how, de how quickly are we decarbonizing all of that energy? Right? How quickly are we plugging in all those solar cells? Those are completely open questions, and I hope I didn't oversell that point. Um, I guess I just wanted to make the point that there are sustainability forces that are already in place. And lots of things, global nuclear weapons, total population on the planet, they're in significant decline. Right? We don't have enough people on this, in, in the developed uh, countries that have nuclear weapons that even know how to dis dismantle them. That's how much social unlearning has occurred in the nuclear proliferation space. So that's a very positive thing. It's not positive with regard to these you know, countries that might become new members of the nuclear nation, but it's very positive with regard to the countries that have been there for a long time. So there are some examples that are yeah, on both sides of that, of that question. Well, it's you know, a fantastic question. Uh, the UN says education of women. If you go to the UN website, you'll find some of the best uh, literature on this. The UN says giving women opportunity to be educated, which almost every culture will allow, allows them to see the value in personal and child development. And they actually, they actually start resisting social pressures because there's a lot of social pressures on a woman in India, for example, to have a lot of kids, particularly sons. And they come not from the woman, but from the social structure she is in. So there's at least five that the UN argues are very high leverage, but education of women is one of the number is their number one, I think. John, thank you very much. On behalf of the students of the Mendoza College of Business, thank you for being with us. Thanks everybody. Enjoy the weekend.